Tradition tethers us through time, connecting our activities to our ancestors and their happenstances and intentions. This continuity of meaning makes us human. Cultural transmission bolsters instinct, adapting our nature and making us fit to more than weather, to thrive amidst endless change. Spring's morning mist. When the nights get cold, heat from the ground radiates, forming water droplets. Leaves turn color quickly thereafter, falling, carpeting hill and ravine. The majority of nitrogen in mineral forms like nitrate and ammonium a plant relies upon is released by the decomposition of dead leaves and roots and animals. All the while it's getting colder. Mist swirls atop current. Frost slows and makes still. Ice begins to take, and snow dusts until it coats clean, reflecting sunbeams up from forest floor, bulked up in velvet shed, a solitary buck in peak physique emerges from a thicket, all instinct in search of does and weary of competition. Pike Island is downstream, just below Fort Snelling atop its sandstone bluffs overlooking a much broader conglomeration of sacred locations, known by the Dakota as Bedote. Filmmaker Sidney D. Bean relays. Bedote relates to the confluence of the Mississippi and the Minnesota River, and certainly within our Dakota stories, it is one of our main creation places. The island at the river confluence today bears the name of Lieutenant Zebulon Montgomery Pike, who, like Lewis and Clark, was charged to lead an expedition through what was then the United States' newest land acquisition, the Louisiana Purchase. Surveying up the Mississippi, Pike and 20 soldiers established relations with local peoples representing the new government, and imposed U.S. law upon the British fur trading companies. Unlike today's densely wooded island, depictions from the mid-1800s memorialize a much more open place, where agriculture and animal husbandry presided. English immigrant Edwin Shadrick Ruddle continued such land use into the following century, purchasing the island in 1922 and managing a farm on it that supplied St. Paul's Farmer's Market. By 1931, Ruddle's business outgrew the small island. And by the late 1950s, Russell W. Fridley, a former director of the Minnesota Historical Society, 
spearheaded the reimagining of the historic fort and its surrounding floodplains use for the following century. Establishment of the park's boundaries in 1961 facilitated the federal donation of the fort to Minnesota. The park officially opened to the public June 3, 1962. Freeways, bluffs, and wide waters serve as boundaries, isolating, sequestering the island under the surrounding metropolis. Anecdotal surveys estimate the island's deer herd is between... We like to count when we walk, yeah. so I mean, we, we, <laughs> we count the, yeah, I think the biggest or the highest we've got is like 26 deer on the island. Oh, wow. On a single pass through. Two. There's probably 40 deer on this island. Okay. Wow. At least, I think. Okay. I mean, I've seen 13, 14 at any time. White-tailed deer occupy a larger geographical range than any other North American mammal. A century ago, they were hunted to less than a million throughout the U.S. Collaborations between citizens and grassroots commercial and public institutions all across the country began putting into practice revitalization programs, those that were specific enough to address the plethora of local ecologies and peculiarities. <music> 2022 nationwide white-tailed deer population estimates range from 35 to 36 million animals. The rivers, floodplain forests, and the deciduous forests of central and southeastern Minnesota were the limits to the pre-settlement whitetail and elk range. Today, whitetail inhabit every county and biome of the state. Deer populations only recently began occupying urban landscapes. Some herds date back to pre-settlement times. Most, however, established during the 20th century. Of this new landscape, regarding deer and their behavioral adaptations too, three distinct habitats become obvious. First, the dense urban core of a metropolis. Here, deer will collect in parks and other nature preserves that offer familiar settings and cover from all the human diurnal activities. Their movement is through riparian areas and follow our right-of-ways, repurposing railroads into game trails. Second are the suburban environments. With so many fertilized lawns offering an abundance of exotic, ornamental bulbs, fruits and nuts, leaves and stems, the food quality and quantity is improved here. Like in the cities, parks are the primary bedding sites, but with the sprawling placement of housing, more green space offers more patches of cover for more dispersion of deer. And finally, the exurbs, where residential land use outside of the city limits is situated among working farms or undeveloped land. Ecologically, the important distinction from suburbia is that human dwellings are interspersed throughout wildlife habitat rather than deer habitat existing as curated islands with jungle gyms.
So many variables contribute to the density and size of a deer herd that any generalization is difficult. Mammal densities usually are inversely associated with home range size, which is limited by suitable habitat. Increased interspersion of suitable cover with feeding sites in both suburban and exurban areas reduce the movement needed to meet daily energetic needs. Generally, home ranges of deer diminish in overall size with increase of human density. Annual home ranges of Connecticut's Bethel Newton suburban doe population averaged 158 hectares, while Bridgeport's urban population averaged 67 hectares. Despite decrease in home ranges, Seasonal behavior still conforms to wild and rural migratory expectations. Summer and winter home ranges for a suburban population in Carbondale, Illinois, average 8 and 42 hectares for does and 27 and 129 hectares for bucks, respectively. Suburban and urban deer generally keep reusing winter and summer locales as well as bedding sites. Deciduous forest and farmland tend to hold densities of 12 or less deer per square kilometer, although 80 deer per square kilometer is possible in forests. Densities recorded in several urban and suburban areas exceed 12 deer per square kilometer. Densities of more than 30 deer were not uncommon. High densities are attained by insularity of suitable habitat, absence of predation, and supplemental feeding by humans. Fertility rates of deer are influenced by population density and physical condition. Fawn, yearling, and adult doe populations of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Ned Brown and this plains preserves in Chicago had substantially lower fertility rates than rural deer. Healthy does usually produce two fawns annually. Populations from these areas exhibited site densities from 15 to 73 deer per square kilometer, which eventually manifests a decline in herd health. Sparser populations in other Chicagoan preserves held deer is in much better health, which in turn yielded fertility rates comparable to non-urban counterparts. As fertility rates are linked to nutritional status, postnatal survival of fawns is inversely related to population density. Suitable fawning sites often become limited in urban and suburban areas, skewing age structures of these populations towards older age classes. non-urban deer populations can double in size every two to three years, magnifying the consequences that high deer densities only create in areas that are simultaneously experiencing increases in human habitation. High deer densities, especially of animals traveling across migratory distances, spread disease, browsing damages croplands and lawns and threatens rare and endangered plant species, and increases automotive collisions with wildlife.
Lyme's disease first appeared in 1975, and by 1982, Minnesota's Department of Health began recording instances of infections. Spread by deer ticks, also known as black-legged ticks, the disease has become endemic throughout the state. Epizootic hemorrhagic disease was first discovered in a Stearns County wild deer in 2019. Not transmissible to humans, the disease causes a fever which drives the infected deer to seek out water. And if it doesn't drown, internal bleeding will eventually cause death. Chronic Wastings Disease First recognized in Colorado in the late 1960s and since has spread to 26 states, three Canadian provinces, South Korea, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Minnesota's first case was detected in a wild Olmsted County deer in 2010. Bovine tuberculosis was first discovered on a cattle farm in 2005. In Minnesota's Department of Natural Resources, wildlife health programs, eight years of disease monitoring alongside wildlife management. So the comparison between the three tissues that you're gonna find in the neck area of the deer, the one on the far, my far right, is lymph node tissue. Uh, it's got the two-tone color, it's firm in texture as we talked about earlier. The one in the middle is the salivary tissue or the other white tissue that's around the lymph nodes. Uh, when you cut this in half, it's all the same color through, um, and it's not nearly as firm as the lymph node tissue. The final tissue is actually muscle sample or muscle tissue. Uh, that's obviously red in color. Uh, you may have some white in the tendons, but it is a muscle tissue. It'll be red when you cut it, a deep muscle red. Reduced the disease's prevalence in the state to an undetectable level. Urban and suburban deer routinely forage around human homes. As generalist herbivores, dietary diversity is important for maintenance of body mass and nutritional health. Healthy deer need to consume 6 to 8% of their body weight in forage daily. For a 150 pound deer, 10 to 12 pounds of leaf material would be needed for its daily metabolic requirements. Increased use of residential areas by deer occurs during winter, in part due to all the anthropogenic food sources, but also for their radiant heat and the wind blockage human dwellings provide. Of the many hidden costs to the prices of our agricultural goods, included are those associated with damage caused by deer. Costs from abandoning fields, resorting to less profitable crops to avoid producing deer attractants, changing crop rotations, and deer management. Rutgers University between October 2020 and March 2021 surveyed 27 New Jersey farmers and estimated that deer cost $1.4 million of damage to this small sample size in 2019. Reported automotive collisions with deer cost around $20 million a year. Minnesota's Department of Public Safety reports around 2,000 collisions across the state annually. State Farm Insurance estimates the number to be more around 40,000. Two, an incomplete tally. Only damage severe enough to warrant expensive repairs are filed. The severity of the problem is represented in the ultimate cost in human life, about 195 lives every year. Wildlife management carries the burden of representing every stakeholder within any particular jurisdiction. With such diversity of value, 
Intention reliably precipitates, if not anywhere else, usually when it's time to debate whether lethal or non-lethal methods are to be deployed. Deer exclosures are one non-lethal means of mitigating some of the damage caused by deer. Designed to keep deer away from vulnerable plants, here they are intended to protect saplings of old growth and promote general understory biodiversity. Overabundant deer herds, each eating 5 to 10 pounds of forage a day, can virtually extirpate plant species from an area. Requiring special concern are those rare and endangered species, setting a sequence of cause and effects through the ecosystem. With any recent extirpation, a previously occupied niche now is open to, and perhaps is favorable towards, invasive species. And, as these effects reach beyond their locality, any fauna population relying upon any recently extirpated plant will too be altered, and so on through a particular food web. Deer herd concentrations at or exceeding 20 deer for 259 hectares can significantly alter plant and bird compositions within forest ecosystems. Exceptional is how effective exclosures can be against deer browsing. Though, to serve as a practical solution, striking how vulnerable to the natural environment they are. A deer only needs a few unabated days. Indiana's Department of Forestry and National Resources, along with Purdue University, published work exploring contraception as a method of controlling urban deer populations. Computer models worked out a variety of scenarios, attributing a 99% efficacy rate to the contraceptive method applied annually in a non-selective manner. A herd in poor condition would be reduced if only 33% of does were treated. A herd in good health would require 90% of does to be treated. Requisite technology hasn't been devised to allow for any serious application and is what, in part, prohibits any estimation of cost. In 1989, the Lake County Forest Preserve District of Illinois, an effort to resolve disparate approaches to managing the deer population of the Edward L. Ryerson Conservation Area, implemented a management plan that allowed for trapping and relocation efforts to take place before initiation of lethal methods. A permit to remove 60 of the 76 deer was obtained, and trapping took place from February 14 to May 1st. Of the 18 deer captured and relocated, one died during handling, another that tested positive for Lyme disease was euthanized, two of the seven fitted with radio collars died shortly after release. It cost $637 per deer, excluding the costs accrued by a partnering organization, representing an average of 38.75 person hours per deer. After a few more attempts with relocation, Trapping and shooting and non-hunting sharpshooting occurred between March 23rd and April 16th the following year. And 39 deer were shot, which produced 2,513 pounds of donated venison to local charities. Services cost $260 per deer at 10 and a half person hours required. North Oaks, Minnesota, another case study, lends further evidence to the affordability of trap shooting and non-hunting sharpshooting. From 1980 to 1983, and again from 1990 to 1994, the city, under advisement of Minnesota's DNR, ran deer removal programs that cost $72 to $197 per deer.
Minnesota state parks and other state lands offer special and restricted hunts as another means of managing wildlife, encouraging citizen participation while raising funds for conservation. Having lost some of their wild essence by living so close to us doesn't domesticate urban and suburban deer. Habituation, as it pertains to psychology, is the decline of an instinctual response after repeated exposure to a conditioned stimulus. Domestication, in contrast, is the training of a plant or animal to live among and be of use to humans. Since they don't live in our homes and, for most folks, offer only aesthetic value, often the countless dollars and damages to cropland and other private property, those related to automotive accidents, and all the intangibles associated with human injury and death overwhelm so much so that our knowledge that the health and welfare of deer too suffers from their unregulated accumulation in human-made landscapes is easily dropped from our calculation. Overbrowsing of a parkland by a confined herd leads to starvation. Sick and injured animals are always much more dangerous. Misery compounds unpredictability. just came after me. Wow. Wow. Not simple stimulus response machines. Deer are more like us than they are like bugs. Consider surprising someone, especially in an ambiguous situation like down the proverbial dark alley or alone in the woods. One person may scream, another punch, while others will faint. Any given confrontation's outcome is the end product of the interaction between the variable behavior of a particular deer and the much more variable behavior of a particular person. From traditions of historical remembrance and environmental revitalization, the stewardship of habituated wildlife a new tradition emerged. How intentional management of our new urban and suburban inhabitants for their sake also is for ours. Mm -hmm.